What up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of the Black Top Podcast. All the boys are back. The boys are back in town. Whatever it may be. Boys, how we doing? Oh, the three musketeers are back together. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't know. It's good times to see us all together again, man. But I'm doing good. Busy as hell, as usual. I'm sure Chin is too, man. This guy's been busy as hell with his schooling. That's got an exam every two weeks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I've just been busy. I've been good. I've been good. Haven't been keeping up with basketball all that much, to be honest. Been a bit of a casual okay. fan. That's okay. Let's hop into it right, though. But for today's episode, we got a few superlatives. Uh, for some of them, obviously, like, you know, most surprising player, disappointing player, the best story. And so on and so forth. But before we get to that, y'all, does Kevin Durant got a weak ass ankle or what? Nah, not I to poke fun, but man, did y'all see the video? He just took a little tumble. I mean, I did see his ankle turn a little bit, but I heard he's in like a boot. And it's like a two week. Yeah, actually, if you look at the screenshot, his his ankle was literally well, like, full, like kind was, of floppy. It was a, bad, it was a full oh, turn. Oh yeah, shit! Turn. It was a full turn. It was bad. But the thing is, like, he actually continued to do his pregame routine after that. And I guess it started oh. to swell up afterwards. But he's out for at least two to three weeks, I believe. Yeah, so that's, like, that's pretty much till the end of the regular season, right? Because there's, what, um, maybe 20 at most until... games? Well, the the play that... starts on the 13th, I think, or the 12th, right? Or no, 10th, to... no, I think it's the 10th. So he's got like let's say three yeah, like weeks couple, from now. A couple more weeks. He'll have he'll like let's say three weeks from now. Best case scenario, he'll come back a week before playoff time. That's a little shaky, that's man. That's shaky. That's tough. Yeah. Because this is the time you want to use to build chemistry, but like, yeah, it's tough. Because, yeah, and like, they've been cooking. Whenever you, I mean, quick reactions. I know it like already happened, but man, that Mavs game. We need a seven game series of that, man. We need that instant instant hood classic fireworks the star power in that in, in, in that matchup is gonna be big time but like yeah man kevin durant is like the ultimate uh how do you what do you call this like he, um that's the safe option where it's like yeah you guys don't know what to, what you want to eat but you know that one place that you can always go to and you can always rely on it's like that's kevin durant man <laughs> true, true, true 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 he's true. that guy that's true but nah, I mean, oh, that game alone. I, I'm not going to lie. That's up there for probably, like, the best game of the entire, like, regular season, low-key. If you, like, think about, I mean, because what other big ones were there? I'm not going to lie. I, I think the, the Kings and Clippers one was kind of mid. For for as much as it was, like, oh, the high-scoring thing. The fact of the matter was they weren't playing any fucking defense. Yeah, I, do, yeah. I don't think there was a very, very much defense played. I, I can't put that up there. Um. There have been so many other games other than that one this year. I mean, just because it's high scoring doesn't mean it's a very good game. Mm. But no, let, let, let's but, uh, let's let's get into the real stuff because you know, obviously, prayers go to Kevin. Hopefully, he's back there because yeah, again, like like I mentioned earlier, that team is super duper scary, fully healthy. When you look at it, the way they've been operating, you know, on paper is one thing, but it's been what maybe two or three games we see them actually operate, and it's uh. Whew, Looking, looking very, very efficient. I will say, I think that's the best word. Yeah, I mean they're healthy now for the most part, so I feel like they can, like they can probably just uh, stay afloat. If they can stay afloat, four, five, six, they're fine. And then oh, yeah. whenever they get KD back in the building, because like whoever is gonna end up playing Phoenix in the first round is not gonna have a good time. I think all I don't know how the loss impacts them, but right now I think it's uh, it's them and the Warriors, right? From what I remember. Well, let's. Yeah, let's do the standings. Let's look at it real quick because I'm remembering. Yeah, so correctly. the Suns are the Suns are fourth right now. Yeah, yeah. Clips are fifth. The Warriors. Oh, are Warriors dropped to six. Can you like, imagine the Clippers? Clippers, Suns. Oh Warriors, man! Like, oh man! First, like, I don't want to see the Timberwolves in the, the top eight, man. That's a boring ass matchup. They're gonna get their wow. ass clapped. There's a lot of movement. Hey, I just realized the Lakers are now ninth. Yeah, everybody is what like a. Yeah maybe three games at most apart if that yeah if yeah, i'm looking correctly um 
mean, the Blazers are, if you're looking at the eight seed particularly, they're two and a half games back of the eight seed. That's the 13 seed Blazers. Like, the West is mad. The West is insane. I love it, man. That that means all these games mean that much more. You know, it's, you know what could be crazy? As great as the play-in is, we could be looking at, like, the last week of the season and it's like completely do or die like lose one game and you're out kind of thing it's like a game seven every every like game almost pretty much i remember when, i remember when that used to matter too yeah it's like a team was like 41 and 40 they needed the win so they can be 42 and 40 and that would get them in i think that's what uh, if i remember correctly actually that's what happened to the Raptors in 2010 where they lost the last game um and uh, oh no, sorry. There's another team that won, and they won, but literally half game apart, right? So if they had won a previous game before that, and this team dropped one, like they would have made the eight seed. Anyways, like it's just cool to see like how like these these small games, like you would think before eighty two games is a lot. Usually there's a huge gap between eight and nine or ten and eight or whatever, but not anymore. Oh yeah, man, it's amazing. Love to see it. Moving on from there, though, I mean, the the one thing we're going to talk about before we get into the superlatives, man. Reuben, brother, l- l- let's hear you talk about the officiating and the Raptors, man. Yeah, you know what? The, this has been a league-wide problem, too, right? Like, mm. I feel like this has been a league-wide problem. Um, Let's start it with this. I think Fred's rant about, like, how there's... He started off by saying Ben Taylor is a horrible official or had a horrible night. Um, he had a horrible night officiating. There's a lot of missed calls and or calls that were, you know, phantom calls most of the time. You guys mm-hmm. know what that means. Um, and then he went on to say most nights between the three officials, there's a guy or two like to just completely screw up the game. Um, and that's happened to the Raptors two games in a row now between Denver where Scott Foster throws out Scotty. Well, he calls a phantom call um, with, uh, if I can't remember, is it Aaron Gordon in the post against Jakob Pertl there? Um, I think so, yeah. Somebody play. somebody yeah. was in the post there. And it was just kind of it's a bump bump game. It's super close. Uh it's one of the, it's that that was actually a really fun game to watch. And then you know, I think Scotty Barnes just he's like talking to himself and Scott Fo- Scott Foster goes, Get out. Throws him out, there's not a warning tech at all. He just boots him out the game. Yeah, I, I I'm not gonna lie, not to cut you off. I feel like he probably said like yeah, yeah. fuck me, Scott, something like that, but like obviously inferring to himself. Yeah, and of course, like he probably said his own name. Like mm. y'all have the same name. Like, yeah, that's that's a good thing to bring up. It really depends on what he said. And it could have been completely misconstrued as like, oh, you talking to me, fam? Like, you know what I mean? You fast forward, obviously that call kind of affects the game because you throw out a guy, technical free throws, and then you lose your one of your 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 main guys to end the game. Clippers game, third quarter, it's really tight. Fred gets called for technical, BS technical, by the way, because he said in his press conference, if you all haven't watched it, he goes, literally, I just told all my guys to fight through the BS. And he got called for a tech. So that's an issue if you can't even talk to your team with a little bit of passion. And that changed the complexion of the game, which is what he said. I think the Clippers went on a massive run. and They were up by double digits at one point in the third quarter before the Raptors had to make their fake comeback again. And that was a pretty competitive game all the way through to the end. Um, and you would like to think if it wasn't for that tech, maybe that's still as close as a game heading to the fourth quarter and you could flip a coin at that point. Um, but this is this is the thing that's to be said. Marcus Smart, this is what I wanted to say offline. Marcus Smart addressed Fred's comments today and how like he's leading the, um, the, the team in fouls or he's in foul trouble as of late. And he said... Listen, man, y'all heard Fred Van Vliet's comments, right? I'm going to let him do all the talking. And it's true because I'm sure Bucks fans, Celtics fan right here, you watch your game and you go, like, what is a ref doing? No, they, right? they, they, definitely, they, they definitely ref reputation rather than, like, concrete, this is the call kind of thing. That's definitely one of the biggest things. The other big thing that I wanted to bring up is refs are definitely calling games because they want to be the center of attention. They think that they can they can um, change the complexity of a game and the intensity because, sure, naturally they're part of a game. But 
you shouldn't have direct impact on the outcome. You should only be calling it as you see it. Reputation calls, phantom calls, guys going, hey, oh, foul. Like, dude, the dude just said, hey, but it's a clean strip. Or um, uh, makeup calls. That's one of the things I hate oh, the most. Man. Yeah. Like, a dude gets fouled down there, but you make it up on the next possession, and it's not even that bad of a call. And there are these things where it's like you're playing in game politics between um, fan happiness, player happiness, coaches yelling at you. And I get, like, uh, we're not in those positions, so we can't sit here and be like, oh, refing's the easiest job possible. You just got to run around and watch these guys. No, you're watching a game that's really fast in real time, and you don't see the angle of the game like we do. Like, if you watch it on broadcast, even from a basketball perspective, you can say, oh, man, he should have cut there. He had a wide-open corner. But when you're in the game, you don't see that because you just see a bunch of heads. Hmm. More often than not, unless you're a guy like that's why people talk about size and being so big is you can see over the defense, you can see things happening, like but anyways, like that's besides the point. Like refs so often lately, at least the past couple of years, have been getting involved and have been directly impacting whether a game is lost or won by a certain team. Especially in crucial moments. Like how many times are we seeing these stupid calls? And it's like, dude, like, if that wasn't called at that point, like, you could say, oh, like, most of, a lot of these players say the right things, like, oh, you know, we got outplayed, oh, we should not put ourselves in that position. Like, 20, like, hindsight's twenty twenty. You look at that call, you take it away, the game's a different outcome. I don't care how you want to say it. Like, you can say all you want, like, it, it, if sands or buts, like, it's the same thing. You might be like, oh, well, you know, Ruben, what if that wasn't called? Then maybe they blew them out at that point. But I don't know. So, I just think there are way too many calls and way too many refs that are directly impacting, like, how a game looks and how it's being played. Because um, they just, I don't i don't know what it is. Like, do they want to, like, they're power tripping. Fred Van Vliet said that. They're power tripping. Maybe they just want to feel like they're involved in the game. They're more important than what they actually are. I don't know. But there's definitely, there definitely needs to be some cleanup happening, at least in the NBA officials thing. Yeah, I mean to speak to that. They they do the whole two minute report at the end of every game. Oh my god, it's the it's, worst thing in the it's world. It's just dude. like it's just like one of those my bad I fucked up kind of things. But there's there's no real repercussions. I mean No, the, there's not it was Eric Lewis in the, the Celtics game, right? Yeah. Yeah, because I mean we already yeah. talked about it how tight the West is. Can you imagine how like screwed you'd feel as a Lakers fan if you miss out on the play in or the playoffs by like a single game? What? Knowing that there's that one there that, you know, call it how you want. We got a Celtics fan here, but that was a foul. Nah, the Celtics sure lost that game. <laughs> yeah, <see? laughs> I ain't gonna see? defend that shit, bro. I'd be capping. It was a clear fun. slap. Yeah. It was a pretty clear slap. And the ref's right there. Um, it's interesting because it's like, you have the two-minute report, but why do we have instant replay if we're not going to utilize it properly? I, right? that, like, I, I think know, that's I the it. double like, double the sword double edged sword of the challenge because like challenge is yeah. this, this the, thing that right now. I, I think they, there's definitely things they can tweak about it like i mean they already talked about how if you win it you should be able to keep you it, can't keep it. Yeah, which i think is a yes. step in the right direction but you know the whole thing was like you know we don't want to slow down the pace of the game which i agree to an extent but yeah. you know you shouldn't sacrifice speed for integrity and to that extent and i mean you know, as 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 much as it does slow it down, you know, the right call has got to be the right call at the end of the day, I feel. You want to know my counterpoint to that, too? Let's hear it. Is the game's, the game's being played, or not counterpoint, but I guess to supplement to what you're saying is, the game is being played the fastest it's ever been played. And no, we I know agree. this, yeah. like the, game, the game is slowing down because of these calls closer to the end of the game. And... I think these guys would rather get the call right than, you know, than have to worry about, oh, the game is slower. Like, we're just taking another break in between. Mm -hmm. Like, um, so I don't know. I think, I think for me, we, we should always make sure that we're getting the correct call. That should prevail over anything else. Because if there's anything that's ruining the integrity of the game, so to speak, Scott Foster said the other day with whatever the hell Scotty Barnes said. He said, oh, well, Scotty said something that was ruining the integrity of the game. 
if we're just gonna let like calls that should be called like go that's ruining the integrity of the game because that means you're not calling it correctly um so yeah we definitely got to clean up that two minute report like i'm not telling guys to be like to be fired from their jobs but i don't know like maybe they're just like for that two minute report this is why, like, sometimes I think about it, it's an extreme situation, but it'd be cool if there was a point system in the NBA from wins and losses, like how hockey does, kind of. Because then, like, oh, maybe yeah. games like how you, to you still get to like, play, yeah. Yeah, you know, and I think there's something there from a rewarding system that could still affect your standings, and after a two-minute report says they should have been fouled. I don't know, like, that's an extreme cause. Um, Adam Silver brought up that they might bring in, like, a Hawkeye. So that if a player steps out of bounds, there's things like automatic calls, which is kind of a cool system because then if a team, if a player automatically steps out of bounds, they call that there's less human error. But anyways, there's a lot of cleaning up that has to be done. But I think making sure the call is right the first time, like, and then, you know, not having to worry about a stupid ass two minute report. I'm all for that. Yeah, I mean, to cut the refs a little bit of slack, I think it's really hard to ref this form of basketball compared to, like, there's no no real foul baiting. And, you know, even even now with, like, the whole, uh, depending on your shot form, if you're, like, kicking your leg out purposefully, now you get called for that on offensive foul. And you you get a lot of subjectivity in this realm of, like, basketball that's supposed to be completely objective. So yeah, I, I think that's where you kind of got to give a little bit of slack, not completely cutting them down from like, you know, being irresponsible to an extent, but it is hard to ref basketball nowadays. Cause you know, so much of it, there's so much, like we always talk, think about players bags, you know, how are they going to get their offensive off? And, and a lot of that now, like, I mean, look to Chris Paul, Trey young, Marcus smart, you know, a, a lot of it now is in the form of like, how am I going to be able to get the ref's attention in order for them to like for sure make that call? That's why you hear a lot of guys yelling, screaming. So it's there. There's a lot of things that need to be done, but I I also feel for what it is right now with how they have to basically make these bang bang plays. Yeah, you yeah. you got to take the good with the bad to an extent. I was going to ask you guys. Let's say you had all the resources in the world. And no matter what your idea was, the NBA would say yes to implementing it. What would you do or add to the game to change or help officiating? I, I would implement something like the sky cam in, in football where there's a guy, you know, they already have in the Secaucus to look back at all those angles. I, I think you so need a guy yeah. to be looking that like in real time, you know, I mean, we have the real the gaps during like the shooting fouls and whatnot, anyways. So I don't think it'd be like a real, real big like problem to implement a thing where it's like a quick little, oh, not a foul. All right, keep going, kind of thing. I think something like that for sure needs to be implemented, no doubt. Yeah, I'm pretty much on the same board with DJ. Like, there, I think it's all in a lot of major sports now where there's like, like whether it be even in like soccer, or, like I, English football, like the VAR system mm, of like yeah. being able to like know like if something is passing the goal line like if that technology exists within like that realm of sports there's no reason why like we shouldn't be able to like have a more detail oriented view of like if something is a foul or not like they can definitely strategically set up any sort of like i don't know camera based system to understand like if like there is like something they specifically need to see like if that is a foul because it seems right now like the nba is just behind in that like in terms of using modern day technology to actually like have the game like accurate as possible um but yeah i it's pretty much along the same lines as dj i feel like it's the only way the game can improve yeah i agree with you both i was gonna say a fourth guy like who's even like drank like you said in between um breaks like he's looking at replays of calls or he's watching the broadcast moment and he's like mic'd up with all the other three refs on the floor at the moment to be like hey guys like uh, that was an out or maybe some sort of automatic call system where maybe it's not like the sky cam or a hawkeye because maybe that technology is really hard to implement even though it's probably not because i mean football american football and english football it's like it's already yeah it feels like the nba is still behind right but 
um, someone that can make the automatic call. So you see a dude step out of bounds or you see that travel happen real time and you go, and then there, I don't know, there's something in the arena that lets a whistle off. I don't know, something like that. But I definitely think there needs to be more eyes on the game that are making calls, uh, who are making decisions. And doing this whole Secaucus thing just in the last two minutes, going, oh, we're going to go to the replay. Like, I think, I think you can speed that up if you had a guy real time doing it as those things happened. That's I mean, just, they always like, cut to said, it. it. It looks like they got, like, the facility to do it. Yeah. You know, whenever we're looking at yeah. Steve Chavy, it's like there's, like, 15 plus screens in that room but i mean yeah. we'll, we'll see what happens i mean you know players associations are all in those talks we talked about it earlier the whole challenge thing so i i wouldn't say we're too far off of uh stuff like that being like cemented and fully implemented into the league for sure yeah but alrighty, heading from there so we got a few superlatives to go through you know let, let's start out right here most surprising player who who y'all got I, think. I was just thinking about these, man. Like, you, you go ahead, Shin. Let's hear it, Shin. I mean, I think when I hear the word surprising, I think it just, I put into consideration, like, just how much this player has stood out uh, when considering the outcomes and, like, kind of their current situation. But I think it's got to be Laurie Markinen. I mean, I did not expect a whole, like, 10, almost 10 point per game jump. Like, I think, like, you obviously see a lot of potential in players to like make substantial leaps and like i think even when he was in cleveland last season he had a lot of like big moments for them um but considering he's in his sixth season i don't think you kind of expect a player to like that's you know been kind of a consistent man through the i guess like through the association for the last five years to like kind of really go from like you know substantial role player to like all-star level like out of thin air after like yeah playing five previous seasons i think i I wouldn't say that i would discount like any of his skills that he has at all but i didn't expect him even traveling to utah to be like that guy in utah like to be honest i i came into the season coming out I'm thinking it was going to be Colin Sexton that's my, my yeah my, my... Nah, I heard that but I thought Colin Sexton was going to be like one of their like little breakout I thought, candidates yeah. I yeah. thought he was going to be the man in Utah Yeah, and then he, he, he didn't even start the season you know starting like he was coming off the bench like, that's crazy yeah sorry am I uh, fuck am I back yeah <laughs> oh my god sorry uh, my wife has like okay. kind of in and um real quick though i think sga is another one like not to say like he obviously isn't wasn't at that level but i think he's just been at another level this year and i didn't really expect him to be the person but i'm glad he is um and then the other one i think like this is not again a huge surprise but it's surprising i think in the circumstance like i do think Jokic to see him still playing at the level he is like with everyone back i think that is a surprise in itself like, yeah. like to see um mpj back and to see jamal murray fully healthy playing you know 32 minutes 35 minutes a game like i think it's a testament to like how good he really is like they're the first seed in the west and he's still putting up you know pretty much identical numbers to what he was doing last year in his mvp season and i think I expected those numbers to drop personally, like when the ball is being shared a lot more with players that are like much more are like heavy on the ball. Like I think he just gets it done no matter what, you know. Um, but yeah, those are my three. I mean, they're all like all star caliber players, but I think they all kind of have had surprising stories this year. I feel that. I feel that. Mm-hmm. I I feel like the only thing that I would probably push back on is the Shea one, because. I don't know. I I feel like he showed like the glimpses of it last year, but the only reason we didn't really get to see it, season. yeah, yeah, that's the main yeah. thing. And he ain't even now, man. He's getting load managed. I know, I know, I know, I know. But still, crazy, man. You're, you're right, though. You're right, though. 
I mean, OKC as a whole, you could probably loop like five plus guys onto this thing. I mean, I think this is a perfect segue for me. The the one person I kind of just chose to show some love to, uh, Isaiah Joe, man. Diamond in the rough. You hear that thing. Opportunity mm-hmm. is everything. And now he's a guy that looks like he's a part of the their nice little core they got going on there. I mean, he's making the most of his opportunity. Yeah. Thinking sure. about what, what they're going to head into the next season with. Shea, obviously. Giddy is, I think Giddy is a guy that hasn't really been getting a lot of love too with how good he's been in his sophomore year. I mean, Jalen Williams is making this like late kind of rookie of the year, whatever kind of push. He's looking real solid. I mean, that whole squad is looking really, really nice to the point where I, I don't want to say they're competing or anything next year. Definitely not. But plan, I feel like, is almost a floor for their for what on what is on paper right now. And I think Isaiah Joe is a guy who's going to be a big part of that. Now, he's not going to average like 20 points or anything like that. But, you know, he's somebody that's able to generate just enough gravity to where when you got Shea out on the court, he's able to operate a lot more easier. Playing with a point guard like Josh Gady is going to get him more opportunities and man, it's just the the thunder are. Yeah. It's it's scary times for sure. It's a good time to be an OKC fan, no doubt. Yeah, no, I agree. Isaiah Jones made the most of his opportunity. Um, <clears throat> we're talking about a surprising player. My surprising player might not be as surprising, but the reason why I'm choosing him as the most surprising player to me is Donovan Mitchell. Simply because the narrative for the last two years with Utah is that he's not an impactful player to winning. Um, even though the Utah Jazz were a winning regular That's season insane. team. Yeah, I can't believe that was a part of the narrative. That's disgusting. It, was, it wasn't, it, but you know that it was part of the narrative. Yeah, because, I mean, around. the whole thing was like, can you win with them? It was, clearly you can, you well, can do mean, something. There, there's a lot of it that was uh, warranted because of the fact that yeah, he's a really good playoff performer, but he was also super negative defensively. Hmm. Um, higher turnover numbers, high volume guy. It's just what you would typically see from a, a, a high volume guard with no defense. And oftentimes you look at those players as low impact players to winning situations. And, you know, oftentimes he was seen as kind of like the black sheep with the Jazz because Rudy Gobert anchored that defense. They had really great role players all around them. Quint Snyder is seen as a great coach who's now with the Atlanta Hawks. So there's always this narrative around Donovan Mitchell that he's not as um, impactful of a player to winning. You move him from Utah to Cleveland, and Cleveland looks like a legitimate contender this year. Now, do I think they're going to win it? No, because I think they have major holes. We talked about this last episode. Like, the three spot is like... We joked about it. You already know what you're getting from Donovan. You know what you're getting from Garland. You know what you're getting from Mobley. Actually, no. I said Mobley was the X Factor. You know what you're getting from Jared Allen. You already know what you're not going to get from Karis LeVert and Isaac Okoro. Isaac Okoro but, could give you 20. Or he gave you 5 on 20 shots. Well, he's definitely not my most surprising player. So, <laughs> <laughs> God, Donovan Mitchell has really elevated Cleveland. And listen, they are from from the Cavs, uh, for, sorry, from the 76ers. They're two and a half games back, but a 42 and 26 record, fourth in the East. Um, you know, a lot of that is because of the fact that Donovan Mitchell has been a huge impact this year on both ends. Like, he's really improved his defensive um, uh, rating on that side of the ball. So. Yeah, he's my most surprising guy because now you clearly see that everywhere he goes, he's going to be an impact. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that, that's my guy. Well, one more I just want to bring up. You know, I had to bring a homer pick here. Brooke Lopez, man. He yeah. is potentially, I mean, today, he almost had a triple-double with blocks. Crazy. There's a chance he ties Dikembe Mutombo for the oldest player to win Defensive Player of the Year. And... I think when you just look at it, I, I talked about it last time. I feel as much as we, I this is the last. I, I said last time was the last time I throw it out, but just so kind of so the Celtic fan can hear it, you know. As much as we want to talk about how no Chris Middleton or whatnot, Brooke was definitely not healthy when you looked at last year. Definitely had a slow start. I mean, he missed the majority of the season, so kind of duh. But 
I definitely didn't expect him to be this productive at his like age 34 season because you know big man 300 plus pounds doesn't have the foot speed in general to begin with but seeing how he's able to like still hang and still be a really really good contributor because I mean I was looking at it I think he's only he's only missed like one or two games if that and not only that he's averaging the most points he has during his Milwaukee tenure you know most blocks most efficient and it's just it's beautiful to watch man Brooke Lopez I mean I hope they sign him to an extension this year you know I hope he retires a buck but uh just just to bring it real back the bias a little bit when you look at how Milwaukee's been defensively as much as you want to say you know Giannis is the best defensive player oh my gosh <laughs> As much as you want to say Giannis is like a dog defensively, Drew's a dog defensively. I feel like personally, especially with the fact that Milwaukee plays a lot of drop coverage, that engine doesn't go without Brook. And you saw that last year. You saw how a large part of like the defensive like flaw was in how they still played drop even without Brook. And you know, we're seeing now turning back the clock a little bit. Well, yeah, Brook is for sure a surprising one because he went from being unhealthy to potential defensive player of the year candidate. So I mean, there's there's kind of like that's kind of a crazy jump if you really look at it, mm. like that's a that's a that's a really really good jump. Um, one guy I forgot, Aaron Gordon, he's been balling. Oh man, he's been huge yeah. to the Nugget success. That's all I gotta say. He's been one of the surprising players this year. He could have potentially been an All Star if there were just enough spots, but like, yeah, he's been balling, man, on both ends. He's that's a really solid contract player. too. I think he's only getting paid what twenty. Yeah, that's a really Ooh, fair contract. Really I contract, mean, that's a yeah. bargain actually for the Nuggets, and he should definitely be paying, get paid more based on his production. All right, let's let's uh let's flip the script a little bit. Who's been a player y'all have been like, man, thought this guy ben was Simmons. gonna be the one? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. We we are we already kind of knew that though. So let's not include him because everybody knows. Yeah, that he's the most important one. Okay. Hmm. What do you guys have to tell me? You're most disappointing man, player. <laughs> this 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 hurts me, man. Well, let me see if I this hurts me as a Filipino. I think y'all can already tell. It's this man right here, whilst I uh, oh, oh sorry, I Houston Rockets. Right. Houston Rockets. Houston Rockets, man. Cooked. Where's that? <laughs> Where's that? So he's at? like cooked. Bro, he's forever cooked, man. This, this is what this, I'm talking this about. Man right this man right here. Volume. This man I'm right here. Guards. I I I'm love no defensive guard. Man, actually I can't even say I love, but to be labeled cuz you know, let's think about it like this. When a player drops 20, that's always like, yo, he's doing his thing. He's out there hooping. But when you're the least efficient 20-point scorer, oh, there's some questions to be asked there. And you know, you can chalk it up to highlight culture, whatever it is. I I love Jalen Green. I, I think there's still potential for him to like be a solid dude. But it's just been very disappointing to see. And you could even loop the whole like. I mean, we'll talk about next the most disappointing team, but the Rockets are for, are for sure kind of like the poster child of that. I mean, it's crazy to see how. There's just no type of cohesion. There's no. There's there's no yeah, there's no develop. They're, they're literally just like. They're they're playing the most expensive open runs in the entire in the entire world. Oh, <laughs> they're, they're they're literally oh, shits and giggles. They're, for real. There's there's no cohesion. There's no like defensive identity. There's no offensive identity. Damn near. It's it's just crazy to see. And Jalen Green's a big catalyst of that. I, I mean, I feel like this was something we kind of expected looking back at the rookie season. Because think about it like this, he was kind of dog shit from like. As soon as he stepped in the I league, know. all I the that, okay, that's just me being nice. No, the, when he stepped in all the way up until, you know, he was like pumping his chest a little bit post all star break, last 10 games, whatever or not. But man, how the fuck do you shoot basically 30% from the field? That's disgusting, man. Ben Simmons that's shoots terrible. better than that, probably. You know, let me, let me, let me compare the two. I'm, I, I would bet it's uh, actually. I have, I have a streak of <laughs> no, yeah, okay. No, Ben's, no, ben, no. ben Simmons is brothers are bobby free throws, dog. I don't know about that one. No, 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 okay. Free throw, disregard that. Ben, ben shooting fifty six percent from the field. 
Jalen Green. Oh, I mean, everything's coming from within two feet. True. <laughs> but when you look at Jalen, Miles, it's... I know. I mean, he's highly touted coming in with like 41, 33. Long. That is a, that is disgusting. Now, I, I will say this as a little bit of a silver lining. I, I think undoubtedly majority of this can, can be attributed to the fact that, you know, again, there's no structure. There's no real way of like, there's no offense there. But we've seen how with Shangun, you're you're kind of starting to unlock a little bit of a thing there. And if he could continue to develop, I, I think if you kind of let it mellow into like a Jokic type of situation, it might have something cooking there for sure. But in order for that to happen, you really need something like, I mean, did did you guys uh, listen to the John Wall podcast with, uh, what's his name? About the Rockets? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, with about the, the Rockets um, with, Theo Pinson. Uh, with Theo Pinson. Great podcast. Yeah. But, man. It's crazy how you have somebody who's undoubtedly right. like <laughs> now, what was your time in Houston like trash. We had a motherfucker name John Wall was talking shit about Justin Houston. Patton. <laughs> yeah. Yo, how was your time? Oh yeah, Justin Patton. How was your time in uh, Man, Patton? he caught the craziest stray. <laughs> craziest <laughs> stray, man. <laughs> Holy Justin Patton. I'm like man, Bro, the, the, like, the man made it. He he thought, you know set up a life and then boom crazy and straight but to bring it back to Jalen man there's just he's the kind of guy where you know he's giving you 20 or 30 how many shots is he taking though he's giving you 20 but he's letting 40 drop on his head oh yeah that's true oh yeah who 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 do y'all got I mean, you could say a bunch, but I don't want to because of injuries. Like, I was going to say B.I. I was going to say LaMelo. But I, I think I'm going to keep injuries out of this. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most disappointing players, um, Russell Westbrook was an easy choice for me, but I think, like, that's kind of like a that's kind of like a system thing, and I don't want to fault him entirely for that. Um, but the one guy that I, I, I did have uh, that's been really disappointing that I thought would have a much bigger impact is well, there's two. Dejounte Murray is mm. uh, is one that I thought like his his impact and his ability to be such a utility knife like on both ends. Like I thought that was going to translate to more success for the Hawks, and in fact it hasn't, and it's done the opposite. And it doesn't look like he's a very good fit with Trey. Um, the other guy I was going to say is Zach Levine. I just don't know what's going on with him. He's having as mid of a mid off. He's been playing but, solid the past few games, though. Yeah, he is. He's but been again, that's like five games. compared to what sixty plus games. Yeah. I mean, he's an all star. I mean, he was an NBA all star this year. He's playing like, you know, a guy who just puts up twenty five points and and calls it a day, right? He's he doesn't have the same impact as he had. And, you know, maybe that's maybe that's the same. Maybe he's a little bit overrated because a lot of his early success last year was because he was playing with a guy like Lonzo Ball who's setting the table, right? And then we saw when Lonzo went down, there was a lot of struggling on both ends. DeMar took on a huge load because then he had to play make. And, um, anyways, yeah. Most, dis yeah, most disappointing, I'd say, so far, it has to be Zach Levine for me. Mm. I think Man. for me, it's got to it's be Rudy Gobert. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think... Walker I, Kessler gives you just more and shooting? Wow, dude. No, honestly, bro. Like, I think Rudy Gobert, like, was just touted for such a long time as, like, this, like, indestructible force on defense. And, like, there are so many highlights from just this season alone where you can tell he is just, like, absent-minded on the floor. Like, Cooked. Like, he does, like, he does not know how to, like, show up on the floor when he's like in a different system like i get like he has only played on one team his whole career but i think you know it's the first season where he has his average like two blocks in a steal and he's not even aver averaging a full steal and he's averaging 1.4 blocks like if you're not literally doing the one thing you're known for like and you're kind you're of like, a useless basketball player exactly. well, i'm taking frederick weiss over his ass man oh my god like he's pretty much down on every single 
like statistic this year and i mean that doesn't really even speak to like how that's kind of affected you know the team he actually plays for like i think minnesota would be in a much better position if he just wasn't there like yeah and uh yeah it sucks because i'm i would say like i was pretty big on him like and kind of his sort of i think ideology to the game because he was like kind of i think in comparison to like how the center is looked at today he was a little bit more traditional just really being like you know pause on this but like big in the paint you know like he 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 was <laughs> like he's just big you know um and i think like he's impregnable kind of that, d man it, yeah like impenetrable he's just uh yeah i don't know <laughs> impregnable I think, I think yeah you just kind of lost that identity and i don't know if it's coming back you know and yeah, really yeah. Really it's been sad hey man he, he... he's a traditional big with no traditional offense oh shit <laughs> he's trash right now oh my man, goodness man. Though, you know what though he's got the same downfall as deandre jordan had oh yeah true oh literally <laughs> deandre oh my goodness DeAndre man jordan. y'all forgot about his name that man was deandre crazy. jordan owes his entire fucking salary to Christopher Emmanuel Chris Paul. Paul, man. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. All NBA these nuts, oh, man. man. Holy. Oh, my goodness. Any other one y'all want to bring up? Man. Um, see Cam Reddish? <laughs> Keep his name out your fucking mouth, Ruben. <laughs> yeah, on, Keep his name out your oh. fucking <laughs> mouth. Hey. Cam Reddish, Woo. full off season with Dame. Shit, man, they might propel him to thirty wins. He's come back and average eight points, three rebounds, and two assists next season. My brother, he is for... playing significantly better than that now. Come on now. Yeah, boy, like nine points, four rebounds, and two assists with three turnovers. La 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 la. Let me put Yo, you. On. I want to see how close I actually am. I'm probably so far off. Huh? What do you think he's averaging? I said nine, four, three, and two turnovers. Oh, generous. 14. Oh, three. With the Blazers. With the and Blazers. three. 14, three, and three. 14, three, and three. So I got the, I got the other stats, right? How about hey, turnovers? That, that's turnovers? What did you say? Three? Yeah, I said three. Nah, he doesn't have the ball enough for that. 1.6. And Actually, he's shooting, I mean, he's shooting basically per 36, 40%. I think if you give him per 36, probably like 3.9 or something. Like that, something insane. But then his, his points... 1.9, you know, man! Keep his name out your fucking mouth, Ruben! Per 36, 1.9? Per 36 is wow. 1.9! Hey, Cam Reddish. Cam Reddish. Dog! I might have to buy a ticket to see you next year, brother. Hell yeah! I still Anderson. want it before he over you. Man, he got traded before. He got traded after I was there, man. I want to see my boy Hoop. Still after you, though. Still watch Ruben, after you after. know that's a fucking lie. Evan Fournier is a European superstar. European super... Hey, man. Cameron Reddish ain't starting for the French national team. Ricky Rubio was a fucking European superstar. Yeah, and look where he, he's starting for, for the Spanish national team. You can't. <laughs> you take any mid ass American player, you put him in Europe, and he's going to be hooping like Cam a god. Reddish. Not Cam Reddish. No, man. You put Cam, Re- you put Cam Reddish on the French national team. Uh, maybe he's not starting over Evan because of like tenure or whatever. Man. Evan Fournier. Or just ass. Same skill. Evan Fournier probably better. My brother. Better shooter, you, you did not. offensive player. Oh, my goodness. He's not. He's not. I'm, I'm not having this debate, man. All I know is next year, when Cam Reddish and the Portland Trail Blazers blaze their way to the seventh seed, I don't want to hear anything out your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I'm going to find a way to bring up Cam Reddish versus Evan Fournier. Hell yeah, man. Cam, I'm, a, I'm a Cam Reddish truther, man. Even though I don't own his jersey. But, okay, let's switch it. <laughs> let's switch it off from players. Who would you guys say is the most disappointing? The Toronto team? Raptors. Uh, of I got course. The Toronto Raptors yeah. on the list too. And the Bulls. I, I can't lie. I, I, I know injuries are a thing, but the Pelicans have been so 
bad. Even without like Zion and the parts where they have BI and Zion, I I think it's just they were we talked one about in it. The West yeah, when they had everyone on paper. So I want to say on paper they can win, great. no doubt. I mean, when you yeah, look at yeah. it, everything they have, there's no doubt it works. But I mean, you know, as much as we've seen the light, it's been very, very dim throughout the season. I mean, they're their own worst enemy at this point. I, I, I hate to make this comparison, but it's almost like Lob City. Such yeah, a good roster, what, yeah. a lot of superstar players, a lot of guys that just work together, but just can't can't keep it healthy. You know, you got CP3, Blake Griffin, you got BI and Zion. But the the ultimate silver lining is the fact that they had the Lakers pick this year and uh who knows, they might load up and might do something some crazy shit during the draft or during the offseason in general. I think they got one year left before they start making some real decisions mm. about their roster. Cuz like this was the number one team, but like I don't know if you can sit through another year of potentially losing or injury trouble. I think you got to get some stability. Um, yeah, I mean, would we say across the board one of the most disappointing teams would have been the Raptors? Of course, yeah. I I, yeah, I thought they'd be at least be in like. I thought they'd be a six seed. Yeah, I thought I thought they'd be around yeah. the six seed this year. Yeah, just. Um, it hasn't worked. I think a lot of it has to, you know, fall on the just... Well, I mean, Saul Ujiri has not done a great job putting this roster together and addressing some of the needs they had year over year. Uh, because, you know, when Kawhi and Danny left, they never really addressed anything. And then when you went into Tampa, they didn't really address anything. You brought back, you brought Scotty Barnes in. You traded Kyle Lowry um, and got lucky in a deal of loyalty to get Precious Achua back. Mm. You know that you needed serious guard help and you had a hole in the center and you didn't bring back anyone. You're a whole year late before you finally made a trade for Yako Pirtle and a couple games too late for it to really matter. Um, and then Nick Nurse's defense system has not worked all year long. Um, for some reason, they're not on a string this year. The whole scramble defense just doesn't work this year. Um, and then the players, like everybody's playing for contracts or playing for themselves. Uh, so, I mean, they've been the most disappointing team to me, at least in the league, because everyone came in and saying, well, look out for this team. They're going to be a top top 6-5 team like you guys are saying. I think one of the most disappointing teams for me this year has definitely had to been. I said I said this year that they'd, they'd be a top team in the West, and the Mavericks have not. One, oh, man, one player I forgot is Christian Wood, man. He has not performed. See, I don't, I don't know if but I put like, that on him though, man. I can't put that on him. J- Jason Kidd's, gonna... Jason Kidd's yeah. been putting in some sh- shitty situations, man. Yeah, his rotations have been weird. I'm it's say not it a weird. system that I think he's thriving in because it's just like we. I think we talked about this at some point in the podcast, but like they, they kind of are very reminiscent of like the Harden Houston era where Luca mm. is just fucking holding that shit, and you know what's it called uh christian Wood is just kind of expected to like pick up the trash when he's really yeah. not that clint capella ask he's he's like he really is like a three-way scorer but like he just like isn't getting that opportunity to be that person you know so but i i do agree like his yeah. production has been you know disappointing I, I i'm high on christian wood man he was I think we all are. cooking we're all in the beginning of the year man cooking yeah. I think we're all Christian with truthers here. Like, I really think he's got legitimate skill as a like a top three option in, in the league. Like, he he could be a twenty and ten guy. Option. Twenty and ten. That's what it was. That's literally what he was in the NBA. There's not very many guys you can sit here and say, "Oh, he was a twenty ten in one season." Like, not nah, Christian Wood is literally that dude. I'm taking but, Christian yeah, Wood over DeAndre sure. Aiden, man. Oh, really? Hell yeah. Oh man, that's Chin, that's are a, you taking Christian over DeAndre? That's a tough I'm debate. Not. I think like if I'm the Raptors, I'd take Aiton. If you look at your team right now, you'd probably take Christian Wood over Aiton because you got Lopez and because I mean it depends on fit. Like Christian Wood, I think for my team, I would take like if it's for the Celtics, I'd probably take Aiton. Here's the thing, man. But no, no Aiden. But Sorry, go on. Aiden doesn't even average twenty. Even if you even if you look at his entire career, you take out the KD, you take out all that shit, doesn't even average twenty. And I don't think he's let, let, let me 
look this up before I'm spitting out my ass. I don't think There's he averages about double Asian digits. Stable though. There's yeah. something about Aiden. Really I, I, think stable, Aiden I think Aiden because of his like his size and frame, like like in the Celtics situation, like yeah. they don't have that. You know, I Christian Wood is, in my opinion, more of a true four than he is a five. Like mm, that's fair. I would agree with that. That's yeah, fair. I would agree with that. I don't think you take him for his defense at all because he's not like. But well, uh, let's be real here. You don't take Aiden for his defense at all either. Though. Yeah, Aiden, Aiden ain't <laughs> shit on the. De- <laughs> I don't know. I I mean it's fair point though. Fair point, Chin. Like I, yeah, I think Christian like Christian Wood is definitely a true four. Size I mean, does matter in this situation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, size does. Matter. They're both six eleven. No, but when we're talking yeah, about the pounds yeah. out, yeah. It's just, but let's it's be real just, here. On the blacktop, 11 0 Christian Wood, man. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Christian Wood's whipping oh, that boy. Yeah. Christian Wood's cooking him, bro. He's cooking him. Yeah, the Mavs have been disappointing, though. I, and Dude, I, I said they're going to be a top three team man, this year, man. Frick it, man. Christian Wood could be the third option. I, I, I think that's really what the team's missing. They, they need a guy. Who takes away? Who's able to like create his own offense outside of all the dribble, 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 dribble bullshit? And I feel like kids trying to like implement some of that, but I think as you alluded to in the last podcast, Ruben, they're they're really trying to like they're trying to have their cake and eat it too when it comes to defense. You know, they they quite literally probably have yeah, like on paper, their backcourt's probably the worst defensively. <laughs> yeah, that's not even a question. So you know, you you need to put, you need to let my boy, you need to let my boy in there, let him come off the pickings, the pick and pops, let him catch a few lobs here and there, and shit, shit's gonna be super sweet. I don't, I like that's what I don't understand about the team is because they 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 fully invested in going three point shooting, and spreading the floor last year. That's where they found success, and then they ultimately found uh, a formula defensively, which was just. Um, pressuring up, um, uh, switching everything, and then uh, on misses, just push the pace. Um, and they found a lot of success doing that last year. Sometimes your your defense is, is your best defense is your offense. And if you can come down and get that basket back quick, sometimes um, it's 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 depending on if your opposing team can keep up with the same output that you're you're also playing with. And I think Dallas is just kind of like I don't know. I think they messed a little bit too much with what was working. I think uh, they're a separate, they're a, a different uh, situation. What the Raptors did is like the Raptors are sticking with something that doesn't work, as opposed to the Dallas Mavericks, who are fixing something that's not broken. And in the process, they Ooh, broke. Good it. analogy, yeah. So it's you know I, that's not a look at the Mavericks, but they should have been a way better team this year. I think the Kyrie trade was a really good opportunity for them. But I think they could have been a really good team with Dinwiddie and DFS. In the and top I don't think it's like just... they were strapped for cash to pay Brunson, no? From what I remember. No, they offered. They were yeah. offered him the, the the max. It's just Brunson wanted to play the more opportunity. Or... Yeah, I feel that. Shit, should have gave. Should have gave Rick. Should have gave Rick Brunson coach. that job, man. Yeah. So. But I right, let's head to some happier things. What What would you guys say is like the best story from this year? Sacramento Kings. Yeah, true. I think what I have here, like written down, is that this season has been a testament to the idea that team chemistry wins games. Mm, I like that. If you look at like pretty much all the top teams, you know, minus I guess the Suns because they picked up KD, like every team here has been pretty much a well-oiled machine over the last few years like the kings obviously made that move last season to bring in demontis sabonis but even without that like they've trusted in deer and fox and trusted the process in him the nuggets have been pretty much the same team for the last how many years since the aaron... bubble low yeah. key outside yeah. of like the aaron gordon thing and we already know the and bucks and... Mm-hmm. yeah exactly we know the bucks and celtics are both homegrown teams practically like I think it's like the nicest thing to see in the NBA because it kind of shows that this is probably the route I think a lot of people will be going, especially when you kind of even see the trades being made, like, you know, not to backtrack, but I think that Kyrie trade, me personally, like, that's just going to blow up in the Mavericks' face. Yeah, Kyrie's not going to go back. He's a one-year loner, and, like, they're they're just going to be fucked because they don't have anyone around Luka. Like, that's going to be the story, and I think there's going to be lots of that in the NBA, like, if people continue to, like, give up a ton for players um and so 
these formulas of like playing through the draft or like growing through the draft, I think is going to become more and more relevant. Um, so that's been like my favorite story is just to see like all like the teams that are homegrown continuing to play well. Mm, I like that. Yeah, for me. I, like that. I mean, you can see that. Sorry, I just wanted to Oh, add. go ahead, You Ruby. can see that with teams that have struggled. Like, the Warriors were one of the worst teams in, in the West, and look where they're at now. They're sixth in the yeah, West. Exactly. And then just sometimes you just got to stick with your guns. Um, yeah. The Raptors are clearly not a team that have reflected that, but they're the one anomaly. Um, I think the Knicks, too, right? They've kept roughly the same roster. Yeah. You just had Definitely. Brunson. But like they've had the same roster, Tim, like Tom Thibodeau has been there. The Knicks have found a lot of success. Um, yeah, like let's look at it. The Kings, roughly the same team, other than adding some bonus. The Nuggets, the Grizzlies, no, the, Grizzlies the Suns are there, yeah. right? Like the Grizzlies, like we could talk about. That's a homegrown ass team. That's, that's literally a, that's a squad. <laughs> straight from the tree, bro. Squad. That's straight from the tree. The Warriors, um, and then you look down, down like the teams on the other half of the Western Conference. So all the teams that were built off of trades. Lakers, um, the Wolves. Yeah, exactly. So that's a great point, Jim. I love that. Now that that's a, And then Ruman kind of set it up for me. Talk about the Warriors. My my best story is shout out to my mother. She loves this man dearly. It's her favorite player. Clay is back. You know, Clay Thompson's having yeah. a career year by all stretches of the means. I mean... I think you attribute a lot of that to the fact that this is first like off season where there's no recovering, you know, and he's a big reason why the Warriors stayed afloat with Curry out. And I think you just hope that they're able to get a good rhythm heading into the playoffs. Today wasn't really a good uh, sign of that, but you know, there's, you can, it's not crazy to say nobody's ever beat this core healthy. And, and I think when you look at, the potential of the roster it's definitely shaky i'm not gonna say like yeah they're, they're coming out the west for sure but it's one of those things where time and time again they could be 40 and i'd still maybe pick them to win a game or two and when you look to a lot of that clay is a big reason for that because i mean mark mark jackson man the truth probably probably took a lot of smoke saying what he did like like decades ago but Lo and behold, that shit's ringing true. And, you yeah. know, it's just great to see it. Because, I mean, it was crazy to see the disrespect that Clay got. Because it was like, you know, Clay Day, everybody was on his dick. Everybody's, you know, hopping on the, hopping back on the train. And then, boom, shoots like 30% to start the year. And then, boom, coming back into the start of this year. Not off to the hottest of starts. And I think just seeing him just constantly fight back that adversity is just not a testament to him as like a basketball player, but him as a man. You know, I, I think there's going to be movies made about him for sure. And it's just crazy to think that, you know, he's like fully back after having two, like, if you put it like not even 10 years ago, probably career ending injuries almost. Yeah. Man, it's I mean, just great to see he's, shooting, he's still shooting forty-one percent from three this year. What, what's That's the volume at too? He's he's shooting like hey, probably he's, twelve he's shooting a game, 10 right? Yeah, he's he's, uh, he's struggling. He's, that he's yeah, a he's cat's Most makes this year, and most makes on average this year. Um, if I'm not mistaken, as well, this is his third highest scoring average uh, wow. of his career under. The sixteen and seventeen seasons. Actually, he's tied with. I think February his best scoring record. Yeah, I, I think second February best. this year was like his career high. No, I think I saw something what like did that. He have? Yeah, he was averaging like twenty six or something. I think. Yeah, he's got. Well, he's averaging twenty two point one, which is actually tied oh, for yeah. second best of his career. So I mean, yeah, he's having a hell of a year. Um, and he's definitely doing a lot more work. Uh, from the three point line, I think that. Um. You know, a lot of what his explosiveness and his rhythm is lost, especially when you lose a lot of time off the court like that, um, especially when the injury that he faced and multiple injuries. So uh, it's been nice to see the adjustment has been made to his game, but he's still finding that success. Mm -hmm. It's just too bad because he was that three-level score where he was a guy that could post up in the mid-post, off the mid-range, off DHOs, and he was more explosive coming off those screens and all those... Um, secondary actions but like the fact that he's been able to adapt and just be purely a lot of guys like you know 
off the three point thread and, and um off pull ups on three point line and even bro the volume is crazy like you really think about 10 three pointers a game like that's that's obviously his most of his career um but still finding success the fact that he's shooting 10 of them thanks and he's still averaging 40 percent from three um yeah i'm just glad to see that he's found success and like despite having to adjust his game quite a bit um and I think he's a huge part as to why the Warriors stayed afloat with, with Steph oh, missing yeah. so much time. Like, damn, he's playing all-star level basketball, man. Yeah, not to, not to backtrack too much, but man, if we want to talk about disappointing players, Jordan Poole, I, I think, is one. But not to take away from Clay, yeah. but man, Clay is Clay is back, back, I think. that You know, it's crazy to think that Curry's, what, 37, 36? There's still, like... Uh, I, I I don't think it'd be crazy to say they got at least like two more years of being like highly competitive, especially if they tweak the roster around a bit, get like some veteran presence for sure. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Oh, and another surprising player, you know, the Villanova boys, the, the former buck Dante DiVincenzo, I think is another big reason they've been able to, you know, keep the ship, uh, keep the ship afloat for sure. Mm-hmm. But all right. We, we got a couple more to get through here. We might be able to just speed through these, but uh, I don't want to just say the word best rookie, but who would you guys say has been like the most impressive rookie for you so far? What an honest answer for me. <laughs> what an honest answer for me. Let's hear it. I don't give a damn about the rookie class this year. Damn, really? I <laughs> like this class. I None like of them this class. to me except, except for Benedict Mathurin. Mm, Canadian boy, man. Yeah. Uh, Jalen Williams is having a really nice upward season. I mean, he's really his trajectory throughout this year with OKC. Um, heck, a, heck of a have a growth spurt in terms of his game, just growing throughout the year. Um, Paolo Big Carroll has been pretty solid all throughout the year, but he's kind of he's kind of hit a bit of a rookie wall right now. Yeah, anything anything outside like outside of the painted area, uh, that's that's kind of sus. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and and yeah, this rookie class has been really hard to pay attention to. If I if I'm not gonna lie to you guys, really, I like. I'm not one, gonna yeah. lie, I like this class. I mean, I, I feel like it, it already reminds me of that 13 class, which is like a good, good solid collection. Of Wait, the, the 13 that's Giannis's. That's like, come on now, yeah, there's Giannis and it's Giannis, and then it's like everybody else. It's or not it's that. Not it it is. Like, come on, bro, class. you can't put there's that class, class up 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 front with Anthony Bennett. I gotta search this up now. Just oh, to... it might be. Sorry, sorry. It was a fourteen class. My bad. The fourteen. There was one class in there where everybody thought that these guys would go be money team, and they ended up being dollar team. <laughs> Dang, I don't, I like this class. I mean, you got a you got a decent crop of guys who've been like all been playing solid minutes. I mean, for me, the guy I picked was Keegan Murray. You know, I, I think he's the best rookie when it comes to playing winning basketball. You know, no one shoots as good as him at the same volume for a rookie, able to guard multiple positions. And, and I think he's almost like a Mikael Bridges and he can definitely develop into something like that. But he, him and uh, Kevin Herter, I think, are really, really big reason why the Kings have been able to be successful. You know, Fox and Sabonis aren't three point threats by any means, but by, again, the gravity that those two are able to create gives them just that extra bit of daylight and when you got deer and fox you don't need that much to make something beautiful happen sorry i lied about rookies there's one in particular i already mentioned his name earlier but i love him walker kessler true come on now walker kessler love absolutely love him i absolutely love him oh my god i love him he's so good like defensively like the impact that he has on the defensive end and then he's a guy that can spread the floor <clears throat> super skilled on the offensive end um, I think he's got all star potential. I actually really enjoy watching Walker Kessler on the Jazz. Like he's so good. I mean, he I think he could, Rudy he could almost be Rudy like Gobert with offense. Man, he could even be. Uh... <laughs> oh man! Shit, man! You, oh, you put some more Jordan. weight on him, he could be a fucking better Brook Lopez, low key. Mm. Well, he definitely won't have a DeAndre Jordan fall. <laughs> no, nah, because Walker Kessler actually plays basketball, man. <laughs> and he just catch fucking 19 yeah, that's, lobs. That's, that's for as hell, yo. <laughs> he actually plays basketball. That's crazy. 
That's crazy. Well, let's be real, man. DeAndre Jordan's got the easiest job in the NBA right now. He's fucking backing up Jokic. Yeah. He's still on the roster? Uh, actually, he might not be, now that you mentioned it. <laughs> but yeah, the, <laughs> last one, last little superlative we got. Who would you guys say has been the best offseason pickup? I actually have a pretty like unorthodox answer. Or not unorthodox, but one that maybe I personally think you guys maybe didn't put down, but I personally think KCP for the, mm. the Nuggets. Yeah, I like that. Like, pick, like I, I wouldn't say maybe it's the best offseason pickup, but I think he has been like the glue guy on that team. Like, you know, aside from how good Aaron Gordon has obviously propelled to this season, I think he has been like what he was for what that 2020 Lakers team. Like, I think he is pretty much emulating that game, like being a defensive, like minor guard. Like, I think he has the most fouls for the Denver Nuggets, but I think that attests to just him being present on the defensive floor. And I think that's something they didn't really have, like, in their kind of roster makeup for a long time. And I think the Denver Nuggets have been much better as a defensive team this year. So, yeah, I think that's my best offseason pickup. Personally. That's a good pick. I like that. Who we got, Ruben? Um, I got two. I'm going to just talk about – I'm just going to get the, the, the big name out of the way is Jalen Brunson. I mm. think he's by far been the best mm. offseason yeah. free agent that's made a huge impact. MIP, man. MIP. No, to, I man, he's been awesome. Like you can't. There's really nothing more to say about Jalen Brunson. Like he proved all the critics this year to be like, oh well, can he actually run a team by himself now? They're fifth in the East. The Knicks look like they actually could make some noise in the playoffs this year. I mean, they're a tough play team to play, and uh, Jalen Brunson is the engine that makes that thing go. I think the other one that I really want to say is another guy that I, I love, Christian's root, like another player that you don't really think of and i think he should be in the sixth man of the year conversation is malik monk mm, yeah awesome for sacramento and he should definitely be a sixth man of the year conversation and and on the east side i would say the same thing for mac and brog brogdon for the celtics even though he struggled with injuries here and there he's been a really good player for the celtics too so <clears throat> just those two guys aside from uh the clear cut for me i don't know six men i got a question for you reuven Who's got the most double doubles off the bench this year? Is it Bobby Portis? Fuck yeah, it's Bobby Portis. Yeah, I know. Of course, Bobby Portis has been awesome this year. There's no doubt. Like he struggled with injuries this this year too, right? Yeah, he he's, yeah, he's, he's just good. coming off of like I think it was like a two or three week layoff. Yeah, no, Portis should be in that conversation every year as long as. Mm. I think last year he, he he had a good chance, but then obviously with the whole Brook thing, he got knocked out of like contention. But yeah, no, Malik Monk, super solid pick. I mean, just the fact that you have that story of him and Fox, the backcourts back together, and he's like yeah. the perfect six man, I feel. He's in that mold of like he can create his own offense, gives you a little sprinkling of playmaking, and it's crazy how the Lakers just let him walk because he was like their third best player last year. Yeah, I mean... I don't know if they were going to afford him for the, the the price point that he got with the Kings. Yeah, I guess he hindsight's certainly, everything. He certainly got yeah. the bag. He certainly got the bag. And um, I'm glad he ended up with the Kings because, like, he got the bag and he's in a great situation where he's mm. playing impactful minutes. And that was always a question about him, right? A guy coming from Charlotte. I mean, when the Lakers signed him, there was a lot of, like, if, he, if hands or butts about him. Like, is he even an NBA player? And, like, you know, he's proven it so far that he's he's – you know, he's one of the best offseason pickups for sure. Uh, yeah, for me, it's another guy on the Kings. I think Kevin Herter. You know, mm. Healthy. Yeah. He's only missed three games so far this season. He was a big sleeper heading to the season for me. I mean, again, like I said about him and Keegan Murray, his shooting, especially with the fact that you can tell there's a lot of those same like Golden State sets in uh, in Mike Brown's offense. There's a lot of those like coming off of flare screens dribble handoffs all that good stuff and i mean do y'all remember at the beginning of the season he was shooting like 51 percent from the three yeah crazy yeah. i mean Kayvon is a Kayvon's a dog and i don't want to like fully cement him as like in the mold of a clay thompson but the way he plays the game how he gets open on a lot of his shots definitely not a defensive end but 
from the offensive standpoint, there's a lot of similarities, I think. And, you know, when you look at uh, how he's been playing this year, there's a lot more confidence. I, I feel like when you look at his Atlanta uh, tenure, it was a lot of, like, trying to fit into a role, trying to, like, not step on Trey Young's toes to an extent. But now you see here Mike Brown. It's a good free-flowing offense. There's two guys that can really help distribute the ball, and Kevin Herter is, like, really, really bearing the fruits of a lot of that, I feel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and like I think the the Sacramento Kings did a lot of things right in the off season. I think I think like we Brown. all said they we they had a really really good off season. I'm not gonna lie, I think they had the best off season. Yeah. high key. Yeah, I think we did say that. I mean, yeah, I think we did. Oh, I think well, we mixed that in with the Clippers. We were saying a lot about the Clippers. Yeah, they, yeah. They added Cub and and <clears throat> but. I will agree. Like they did a lot of things right this past off season, starting with Mike Brown. He set the culture. He doubled down on that duo that you have: Kevin Herter, Malik Monk. Awesome pickups. They drafted really well. Keegan Murray. Um, yeah, and I think they're they're solid. Um, one off season pickup, and correct me if I'm wrong. If he was an off season pickup, or he just managed to find his way in the rotation. But I would say a lot of the reason why the Suns have been able to stay afloat despite not having Jay Crowder a lot or um, uh, the lack of depth is Josh Okoge. Max, man, yeah. I'll, I'll, he's I'll look awesome. that up. I mean, he's he's been really good, man. He's been he's been such a st- stabilizing um, factor for the Suns, like on both ends of the floor. Shooting the ball really well. He's taking most of the time the best defensive assignment. Um or the toughest defensive assignment, sorry. So he's been really good, man. Um, yeah, he signed a know, vet like, man in the yeah. in July. Yeah, he's he's um, you know not getting enough praise, but clearly he's been able to be a, a contributing factor to that team. I like that. Yeah, man, Josh koji has been hooping for them for sure. And and I think they talked about a lot on uh, the last. I think it was in the. During the Mavs games, we talked about how Monty Williams has really empowered him, and you've seen that where the the few spot starts he's had to make, he's been super solid. And you know, again, I was somebody who was like, ah, the depth looks a little wonky, but Josh Okoji's definitely a guy who uh, really contributes to that. And I mean, he's I think the perfect kind of bench player that you need for that team, a guy who's gonna shoot the ball, play some super solid defense. I mean, uh, he's probably got one of the best defensive highlights of uh, the season. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, I again, like it's just about having the right role players that can help you stay afloat. You know, and with losing Mikal Bridges and Cam Johnson, and how he's having one of the best stretches of his career so far. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just a testament to the work he's put in, and, and it's just like <clears throat> it's also a testament to Monty Williams, like you just mentioned, like empowering your players with confidence, and like Josh Kogi has been really has really stepped up to the plate. And again, no Jay Crowder, but you have a guy like him stepping on. Like you, you know, you obviously have to look back and be like, "Man, we made the right decision." Yeah, for sure. I mean, anything else you want to bring up? Whatever it's like, I don't know, Ruben. If you want to gloat about the twenty twenty two draft class, whatever it may be. I want to gloat about it, or I just want to forget about it. Oh my god! I'll gloat about the twenty three draft class. That's why you know I'm really excited for the Spurs to get Oma Nyama. Oh, I want it to be a Hornet, man. I can't lie. I want it to be. Oh, a Hornet. I don't want nothing with him to do with the Hornets, man. Michael Jordan can't lead a team for his for his life. His life depended on him. <laughs> Shit, man! He so probably picked Scoot if they got the first pick. <laughs> bro, he's he's the goat on the court. That's a sheep off the court, bro. <laughs> Shout out Michael Kate Go, Chris, man. Uh, uh, wait, before we go though, Ruben, man, <laughs> I, I think you're the you're the one team out of us that has like it's gonna have like at least a decent draft pick. Well, I, I don't know about where the Celtics are at, but the Bucks definitely don't have any. But who's uh who are some of the guys that you're looking at for the Raptors to draft? I I haven't done 
fair to be to give a fair assessment of who I haven't really looked at all the draft prospects. I usually do that closer to the draft. Mm. I mean, um, we got March Madness coming. It's hard though. That's oh, I guess a little like little yeah. side note. Being in Canada, it's super hard to follow NCAA like basketball. It is. It's very really difficult. Hard. Yeah. So most of the time, I follow a lot of uh, a lot of college analysts, and mm. uh, most of the time they share their prospect boards. So I'll just follow that. Uh, but I'll do a lot of my study here closer to the draft because then you get like really in depth insight and and packages are put together players. But uh, one guy I love is Amen Thompson. Thompson's oh my god, in, looking nice. Yeah. Oh my god, Amen Thompson, man. Oh, get that guy in the Raptors, bro. That guy's insane. Um, I could easily say like, yeah, give me um. You know, give me Scoot and Wembenyama, but I don't think the Raptors. I think a guy that's being there. uh, I've seen in a number of mock drafts heading to you is Jalen Hood Shafino. He looks good, big guard. I've not seen him yet. Multi level scorer, plays defense, looks good. But no, uh, we really appreciate y'all making it this far. If you got to this point, for sure, leave a like, you know, comment, whatever it me five stars. If you're listening to the audio version, boys, y'all got any last comments to get in? Stroke that thing, Kazo. Nothing left for me to say, but LeBron James is the GOAT. I can't lie, yo. After he passed Kareem, I, I think it's equal. I, I don't uh, think there's a separation. Yeah, it's, it's a 1A, 1B, but he won't yeah. be. Yeah. <laughs> oh, another conversation. Bring that to the black top, yo. With the goats conversation. Okay, this, I, don't a, I don't want to make this a. I don't want to make this a full drawn out thing. That's a thing where it all depends on who gets first ball, because whoever gets first ball is not giving that fucker up. Oh man, LeBron's dominating everybody. Is he though? <laughs> is he LeBron? though? No. Give him the ball in the post, man. He's six nine two sixty. On the black. Giannis ball. is working that ass. What do you mean? Oh, he's not in the good conversation yet. Yeah. He's not. If you're giving us the four options, he's not in there yet. Yeah. It's Kobe, Mike, LeBron. Who's the Kobe. fourth guy? Kareem trying to put Kareem, Kareem. in the car- <laughs> Kareem's Kareem. getting in that. Look I mean, if we're talking black top. Like, if we're talking go to the blacktop, I would never put Kareem on there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like, hell no. Kareem was playing at what, 220, if that? Jamal Crawford's cooking him, bro. Uh, <laughs> Jamal Crawford's is, cooking Kareem. I think the truth is KD is cooking everyone. Like, every single person. Yeah. Like, that one but video yeah. still of that, like, USA combine of, like, the one dribble. Like, <laughs> oh, he worked like, Paul George's <laughs> ass, wasn't it? Yeah, there's nobody. He fucking worked him. Yeah, there's, there's no guy. way. He should never be in this blacktop discussion because I think like all three of us would just yeah. never be. Yeah, we would just you never argue? be about it. We would just be like, "Oh, KD against uh, yeah, you already lost right there." <laughs> what about Mello? Nah, I take no, 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 not over Kate, not over KD, obviously, but like in general, he's oh, another one I think Gen would be. Zers, Gen Zers, we're talking about Carmelo Anthony, the real. Melo. Oh my goodness, I got any, I, I would never. Lamelo hasn't done never. shit to earn that name. I know, never call him Melo, bro. Hell no, man. He's Lamelo Ball. Melo is Carmelo Anthony. Let's get Carmelo that. Anthony, man. Just sign a contract with the Lowe. Milwaukee Bucks. Clay, get your ring, my brother. Yeah, man. Carme- Carmelo Anthony and Katie would be an interesting one. Uh, if, if if we were to throw like the, the forwards conversation there, T Mac, Katie, uh, Carmelo, who's another top scorer that was like, like, uh, like you, I mean, you could throw Paul George in there. Paul George got a bag. Paul George has got a bag. Man. Paul George has got a bag. Paul George just has a little bit of a decent roster. The Heatles ain't shit, man. That's oh man. Seven. Oh, that bro. Yeah, I agree with that. Man. He you willed. He willed a team with fucking Roy Hibbert. Oh, Roy, Roy Hibbert was so good Roy, back then, though. Roy Hibbert made an All Star team averaging like eleven points. 
But he was, oh my god! But he was so good defensively. He changed. The yeah, defensively he was. I David West the was drop the super drop coverage. They played super mm. drop coverage, but because they were because their wings were able to recover. Like Paul George was able to fight over screens, and when he got clipped, he was still able to get all blocks. They changed yeah. the way the game was played that time. David West but, was was oh David West was a good. Okay, guy he was half team. broken, bro. He was, he was still was cooking. Broken, but he, was, he was cooking. He was cooking. He was cooking for sure. Lance Stevens, was, Lance Stevenson was Lance Stevenson. Man, Lance, you know, we want to talk about Morris Peterson, the Kobe stop or whatnot. Lance Stevens is the LeBron stopper, man. Unequivocally. Oh, my God. Lance. Lance, make him dance. But with that, this has been another episode of the Black Top Podcast. We appreciate y'all. Stay safe. Stay blessed. We'll see y'all soon. I agree with you, Chin. Back shots, back shots, back shots.